Welcome to the Paul Street Journal, a production of St. Paul Inside the Walls. The Paul Street Journal is a show all about Catholic economics, from discussing the economic principles laid out in scripture to answering the economic questions that come up in our daily lives. This show will be your guide to making your own economic decisions with the heart of the church. I'm Freddie Garcia, and I'm joined by my co-host, Brian Hansberger. Welcome to episode two of season two of the Paul Street Journal. We've made it to quadragesimo anno, which means in the 40th year. And in the 40th year of what, you may ask? 40th anniversary of Verum Novarum. Boom. So this is released by Pope Pius XI on May 15th, 1931, exactly 40 years after Pope Leo XIII released his encyclical Verum Novarum. And we said, I think, last podcast that Rerum Novarum having other encyclicals named after it or released on its anniversary kind of makes it a big deal. In short, I so guess, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, and Pope Pius makes it seem like a pretty big deal. But well, he Pope Pius calls Rerum Novarum the immortal encyclical, encyclical yeah, he, which is he like drools over praise. it. Yeah, he I know. drools over yeah. it for a while. But before we get into the encyclical itself and and a few more details about how it is connected to Rerum Novarum. Let's talk a little bit about Pope Pius XI, because we talked a little bit about Pope Leo. Mm -hmm. So who is Pope Pius XI? Well, he is very different than Pope Leo XIII. Okay. But very interesting in his own right. So he was born in a province of Milan, which is northern Italy, the fashion capital, capital of the world <laughs> perhaps today. And he was the son of a silk factory owner. So Pope Leo XIII was born into aristocracy, the son of a count. As, as somebody who is defending the rights of workers, you would per perhaps expect someone from a peasantry class be right. doing that. But here's Leo from ar ar aristocracy defending the poor. And then here we have the son of capital, mm -hmm. right? A silk factory owner who is following in Leo XIII's footsteps so I find that to be interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder if his dad was a very good uh, yeah. representative of capital. Yeah. Or if, if if Pope Pius is writing against his dad because he, his dad was bad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but he this this would be like a a very violent encyclical to send to his dad if mm -hmm. his dad was one of the bad owners. But yeah, I I think that's worth doing some research about. <laughs> but but it it good, it's good to know that he comes from capital and perhaps could speak well to that, mm -hmm. which is, it's an advantage, mm -hmm. right? All right, so he was a genius, Pope Pius XI. He had three doctorates, one in philosophy, one in theology, one in canon law. So again, we were talking last week about multidisciplinary academic backgrounds and practice. So here we are again with the same kind of thing. Pope Pius XI was very good with ancient texts. So he knew how to understand ancient languages, how to interpret them. As a Bible scholar myself, I depend on guys like that mm. to do my job. They know Paleo-Hebrew and mm. Koine Greek and, and all kinds of things. In, in, and sometimes the handwriting is, is blurry and they just figure it out. It's very impressive. Yeah. He, as, as a sharp-witted academic, was put in charge of the Ambrosian Library in Milan, which was one of the greatest libraries in the world at that time. So a big, a big job, and he reorganized the whole thing. So you're probably thinking to yourself, like, this guy's a nerd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really well, academic, right? Yeah. But no, he was actually a, an extreme athlete as well. Really? Yeah. Okay. So there are mu multiple peaks in the, uh, in the Alps, in the Swiss and Italian and French Alps, named after him because he was the first ever to summit them. He was the only guy crazy enough to try. Wow. And he succeeded. So uh, in addition to that, he was a techie. So a, a lot of people would think, oh, Pope's there against a technology. A techie, so he's yeah. playing on an iPhone. And well, the big like thing back then was radio. Radio was becoming a thing, and he was, like, right on top of, of the tech and even utilized the tech at, nice. at times. And I think he understood how it worked hmm. as well. At the inauguration of a wireless service, which has been specially constructed by Senator Marconi between Vatican City and the Papal Summer Residence, His Holiness Pope Pius XI, wearing his white robes, 
honors the occasion by giving for the first time a short message to the world through movie tone. Resta tuttavia, resta intera la nostra curiosità, il nostro desiderio di sapere come mai la mente umana veda, per così dire, veda d'una visione così distinta misuri con misurazioni così esatte quello che l'occhio non vede e che la mano non raggiunge. He was also on the forefront of like the social and political scene. So I, I read, and I find this to be really interesting, he was corresponding with Catherine Drexel, who was in like Philadelphia and in Louisiana. So she was very concerned about Native Americans, their rights, about African Americans mm -hmm. and, and how poorly they were being treated in the United States, racism. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of that correspondence, he read Uncle Tom's Cabin mm -hmm. and had this affection for African Americans and, and had this great desire to be of assistance to them mm -hmm. and supported Catherine in her, in her work nice. in, in more than one way. So I find these to be very interesting. And this is a pretty multi talented and and multifaceted character pope mm. pius XI. Yeah, yeah yeah it sounds like it it, it sounds like in 13, 1931 he also is perhaps a little more aware of what's going on elsewhere mm. and, you know we mentioned that pope leo had less territory so less responsibilities more time to write mm -hmm. and you know that must remain true for pope pius well he was assigned all over europe mm. he, he was pretty well traveled mm -hmm. worked in poland for yeah, example, cool. for, a, for a long time. Yeah, but I, I guess I just mean to say that he also seems really qualified, like Pope Leo, three doctorates is mm -hmm. insane. And he seems, from your description, like a thoughtful, intelligent, academic, athletic mm -hmm. Pope. Techie, um, yeah. Yeah, techie, <laughs> right. Um, so, enough about It's him. like if you were to combine Joe, me, and you, like That's a guy like that, maybe. <laughs> okay. Nice. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm the athletic one, if you didn't know. So, now let's get into Quadragesimo Anno, and the time he's writing it in, and what he's responding to, besides maybe the 40th anniversary of Rerum Navarum. Mm. Why does he feel the need to write it? If Rerum Navarum was so great and immortal, mm. why is he writing again? I think it's a great question. So, I, it was, it was a, maybe a booming time, in the 1890s with the industrial capitalistic economy, even though the, the situation for workers might not have been good, the, there was so much technological and economic advancement from a national GDP mm -hmm. kind of perspective. So 1931 is two years after the stock market crashes mm. <laughs> and we're in the midst of the Great Depression. So there's a major economic downturn and there's the world is saying, oh, no, th there was a lack of regulation in the in the capitalistic economy, so we need to fix that. Socialists were saying, like, no, capitalism needs to be rid of, and we need to replace it with communism. And, mm -hmm. and there's all these... The social question that Leo spoke about was still being asked. It still wasn't answered. Mm -hmm. There was no general consensus. So Pope Pius XI is continuing and advancing the argument. Mm -hmm. So what does the world look like more specifically now? Like what needs to be advanced and why? Mm. Well, the, the moral situation needs to be advanced. Mm. So the question is asked, since Pope Leo XIII's encyclical in 1891, has the world become more or less moral and virtuous? And he makes the claim that it's gotten much less virtuous right. and less moral. Mm -hmm. For example, we see the, the rise of fascism. You know, this like violent statism mm -hmm. happening even in Italy, right? Yeah. And, and uh, there's, there's not just the, the social, the big social question, but there's the Roman question. You mm -hmm. know, w what role does the Vatican play politically within Rome, the city of Rome? Right. There's, there's an increase in vicious competitiveness, he says. Uh, people now do what it takes to amass wealth, even at the expense of other people. Mm -hmm. So he's just confirming that that's still the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he goes, he does more than even confirm it. I think he like, he really makes it clear that there's that lack of morality that you, or that loss of morality where people now, it's not just, I want more for my sake, but I will do whatever I can for my sake. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of the time there was this 
you know, this lack of concern for human dignity and this lack of concern for anyone that wasn't, you know, you kind of thing. But yeah, continue, An- yeah, please. An- another big thing is social socialism since the last encyclical is now a reality. So mm-hmm. it was a theory in eight, 1840s. And by 1891, with Rerum Navarum, it still had not yet been practiced or at least attempted to be practiced. Mm-hmm. But the Russian and Bolshevik revolu- revolutions have happened. And now we, we are here in, in 1931, and, pra- and socialism is being practiced to some degree right. in Russia and the USSR. So the goal of communism is to establish peace and prosperity and solidarity among all men by means of savage <laughs> savage warfare and, yeah. and brutality. Mm-hmm. I'm sure everybody could see the contradiction. But there, a new kind of socialism emerged in response to that br- brutal kind of socialistic communism, mm-hmm. which is almost what, what I think you and I would agree is like a wannabe Christian socialism. Mm-hmm. So it's not Christian. We're yeah. going gonna to learn about that yeah. today. But, but there's a whole bunch of people who say, okay, we don't believe in violence. We don't believe in stealing people's private property. But we like socialism, and we want to create a Christian kind of socialism right. like that's, that's in line with or maybe even communion with the Catholic Church. Right. I think it, it, they, those people perhaps try to follow Leo's criticism of capitalism. Like we, we said mm-hmm. in the previous yeah. episode yeah. that Leo was critical just like the socialists slash communists were, but he didn't agree with their solution. So maybe what some of these people are trying to do are adjust the solution so that it's Christian, perhaps, mm-hmm. but, you know, oh, this these socialist virtues are what will fix the problem. And I think mm-hmm. that that's kind of what those wannabe Christian socialists are doing. But Pope Pius addresses that, and Leo did to some degree, but Pope Pius, I think, reaffirms yeah, Leo's yeah. position in a maybe more advanced way. This is, some, this is an area that Pope Pius XI expands upon mm-hmm. because it becomes more of a, of a possibility mm-hmm. since Leo. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everyone. It's me. Sorry for interrupting the show. I'm sure I probably interrupted Brian talking, so it's okay. Um, but I just want to jump in to say that if you're liking the Paul Street Journal and you want to see more content like it, please do like the video, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications so that you're notified when we have any new releases. And also, if you have any questions or comments, please do leave them in the comment section and we'll try our very best to respond to them later on in the episodes. Also, make sure to check out the other shows that are produced by the diocese. Those shows are Beyond the Beacon with Bishop Kevin Sweeney, which you can find on Bishop Kevin Sweeney's YouTube channel, and Coffee with Cupkey with Father Paul Manning and Monsignor Raymond Cupkey, which you can find right here on the St. Paul Inside the Walls YouTube channel. With all that said, thank you. Let's get back to the show. Another big thing with the landscape of this economy of 1931 is that a true social science, a true Catholic social science has arisen. Mm -hmm. So Leo, he didn't start Catholic social teaching economics. He started the doctrine. Right. But since the 1840s, you know, there there were people responding immediately to like Marx and Engels and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's now a, a true science, a true subject of study yeah and the principles on the social question that the church has been providing especially with leo the 13th have according to to pope pius really infiltrated society's intellect yeah it's being discussed in legislatures it's being discussed in marketplaces amidst the few unions that are that are in existence at this time right so it even has established a whole branch of new law. So do you want to read a little bit of paragraph 28 here? Yeah, I will. So, And this is, I think, like you said, Pope Pius kind of giving thanks to Leo's encyclical for mm-hmm. this in a way. He says, A new branch of law, wholly unknown to the earlier time, has arisen from this continuous and unwearied labor to protect vigorously the sacred rights of the workers that flow from their dignity as men and as Christians. These laws undertake the protection of life, health, strength, family, homes, workshops, wages, and labor hazards, in fine, everything which pertains to the condition of wage workers, with special concern for women and children. Cool. So I, I think that you know, this sounds like common sense. Let's protect the like basic necessities of human and workers. But I think what Pope Pius is trying to say is that this didn't 
necessarily exist in such a concrete way before this, after Pope Leo's encyclical. And I think that's why, why I think I read it as him really trying to give thanks to Rerem Navarum for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's something that we take for granted now. We have a law that protects us as workers. Yeah, as, as, as Catholics and as just as, like, the Pulse Read Journal podcast in general, we are, are never aligning 100% with, like, Democrats or Republicans. Right. But <laughs> we, kn we know that FDR read Quadragesimo Anno and was very influenced by it. And he had a whole bunch of Catholics in his cabinet mm -hmm. and, and in uh, his administration. So when the New Deal was released, it was, it, while it, it may not have fulfilled Catholic social teaching on economics, it was certainly inspired by many components of it. So I guess the point we're making here is that Catholic social teaching has found its way into the discussion, mm -hmm. which is a very good thing. Right. Yeah. Another another thing about the landscape of the economy in 1931, some good Catholic associations, I don't like to compare it perfectly to unions, right? Mm -hmm. But some good Catholic associations are on the rise, but they are still far surpassed by bad and sometimes even socialistic-leaning unions. Mm -hmm. So as Catholics, are is it our uh, job to think that all unions are good? No. All unions are bad? No. no. Not every union is equal. Some are better than others. And what we see, according to, to Pius here, is that there's some good ones, but there are even more bad ones. Yeah. 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 I think a, a way that perhaps the audience can think about the landscape the, of the economy and the way that Pope Pius puts it. I think he, he thinks that some improvements have been made thanks to Rerum Navarum. Mm -hmm. Things are, you know, there is some things that are getting better, but there are more things that are, have gone wrong and things are getting worse, especially the really important things like the morality of society. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good way to perhaps read where the landscape of the economy has gone in these last 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I think most of these things show that, you know, like good Catholic associations are on the rise, but there's still more work to be done because we're far surpassed by the really bad ones. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, well there's, there's socialistic movements happening in all the countries. We, we think of Russia, but they're happening in the United States, mm -hmm. all, all over the place. Right. And uh, things are worse from that perspective, but also from an economic perspective. You know, 20% of Americans are out of a job, standing in bread lines. It's pretty bad. Right. Yeah. Another important component of the landscape is the number of non-owning workers has increased, but their living conditions have improved, largely thanks to Rerum Navarum. So this is interesting. First of all, he doesn't use the word proletarian. He uses the, the term non-owning worker. Right. So just be aware of that if you're reading the document. And it's interesting because in the last time period of the 1890s, if you were a proletarian or a non-owning worker, that meant that you were a pauper, like poor and in, in a desperate situation. Yeah, like very desperate, very but, dire. Yeah, so 40 years have gone by, and there are some non-owning workers, some proletarians who aren't that bad off. Mm -hmm. So that's a weird thought for anybody who knows history. The fact that some of them are actually doing okay is something worth noting. Right. It's going to affect Catholic social teaching in, the, in future documents, so we just have to take note of that. Yeah. And, and Pius does take note of that. Yeah. As I want to highlight, this is a great example of like how things are improving slightly but still also getting worse because mm -hmm. the number of the non-owning working class is growing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's mm -hmm. still that, that gap between them and the owners or the employers. There's now m more workers who are still non-owning. And we said last episode that what Ram Navarum was calling for was this distrib distribution of ownership. Mm -hmm. Now there's more non-owners, but they're getting a little better, their living condition. So again, this is, I think... It's, a it's a very insightful observation by Pius. So are things getting better or worse? He's saying both. Like some of the proletarians are in a better situation, but the, the, the amount of people who are owners has decreased not right. increased, right? So there's something wrong with the system in general, systematic change needed. Yeah. Yeah, I think this, is, this I think, would, might be a good paragraph to read because it's perhaps a, a, a portion where Pius kind of echoes Leo in a way, I think. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So 
Pope Pius says, Yet while it is true that the status of non-owning worker is to be carefully distinguished from pauperism, nevertheless the immense multitude of the non-owning workers on the one hand and the enormous riches of certain very wealthy men on the other establish an unanswerable argument that the riches which are so abundantly produced in our age of industrialism, as it is called, are not rightly distributed and equitably made available to the various classes of the people. And that's par in paragraph 60. And I think, essentially, he's responding to that, you know, the, the need for the distribution of ownership is not being met. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a problem, basically. Like th That's a very direct response or, or response to one of the calls Leo had. And I think it's a good thing to keep in mind that 40 years later, he's kind of like, we haven't really done this that well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And one, one last point about the landscape of this era before we get into his, his complaints. So the social structure, he says, at this point in 1931 is composed of individuals and the state. Right. So just imagine like there's this giant state and then beneath that is just every individual yeah. with no intermediary in between. Yeah. There's like no associations and it's just big government, right? Mm -hmm. So he doesn't like that. And he's observing that the state has taken on so much responsibility mm -hmm. in this era that it's being crushed by just all the things it has to do. So many responsibilities. Way too much responsibility for a, a big government. So because the state and these big governments have taken on so much, they've become, in many regards, ineffective. Yeah. And they've essentially stolen responsibility away from smaller, more local organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I think I think that's again a response to maybe that need for the associations. He says himself that the, like the social structure, apart from the state, is kind of what helps the state. And I, you know, I, I would also read it as like uh, the state is e even if the state wanted to take all these responsibilities, to some degree, like the the flip side of that is that like some of them are kind of wasted upon the state because no, no one else is going to take care of it. And Pope Leo himself said that like the state should take care of those who are needy. Mm -hmm. um, but because there's no one else to do it now, there's so many more people that are needy that the state, you know, must take care of. So he, he puts it pretty beautifully, I think, in a very short passage, which I'll read. He says that this is to the great harm of the state itself, for with the structure of social governance lost and with the taking over of all the burdens which the wrecked associations once bore the state has been overwhelmed and crushed by almost infinite tasks and duties and you know this is perhaps part of the landscape but also kind of sounds like a problem mm -hmm. um which we'll now get into i think this is essentially where 1931 the economic state of the world is according mm -hmm. to pope Pius. and now he's gonna we'll rattle off what were kind of his complaints the problems of 1931 mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so this, this encyclical is going to list, uh, we, we've identified four problems that we haven't already, and then it, it offers solutions, right? So the first problem is that not all are heeding Leo's calls in rerum novarum, even Catholics. Some right-winged Catholics are touting certain components of rerum novarum, but avoiding others. You could say the same about the leftist Mm -hmm. Catholics. Really, c each Catholic should be heeding all of what Ram Navarum says, not just convenient parts that fit your political identity right. or, or leaning. Yeah. So he complains about that. He complains about the industrial complex in the urban setting, filtering and out and infiltrating other parts of society, including farming, the rural farming areas. Yeah. Even these parts of society are now affected negatively. Yeah. Industrial nations are affecting the global non-developed world, yeah. non-industrial world negatively. Yeah. So he talks about the you know, upheaval in rural society. He says that society has been polarized between radical individualism on one side of it. That would be the Adam Smith, what he calls liberalism, mm -hmm. which we would call let's say, democratic, like capitalistic kind of thing, mm -hmm. he calls liberalism and individualism. And then the other side would be the collectivism or the socialism or the communism. So 
he says that people are being pushed to these polls. Does that sound familiar? It, it, it's extremely relevant, right, to today. Yeah. And uh, he finds very few people walking the narrow path. Right. Yeah. yeah. And this this problem specifically, I think, is the the central big picture question for, for Pope Pius, I think. That's my reading of it. I think that his encyclical seems a little bit more zoomed out, as it were, than Pope Leo's. I think Pope Leo's, and my reading of it, seemed a little bit more directive, speaking specifically about the workers, the employers, and their duties. Mm-hmm. Of course, with the, the principles and the philosophy baked in. Um, but I think it seems like to me that Pope Pius is kind of touching on this broader social question, and mm-hmm. specifically this one about, okay, we're getting pushed to two polar extremes, individualism and collectivism slash socialism and like you said i think we'll later get into it a bit more but his response is that it's the middle ground it's not either or but it's both and so it's and and neither (laughs) (laughs) in in many cases neither. yeah yeah but it's you know the social question is individual and it is collective Mm -hmm. um and i think that's kind of the the philosophy baked into the entire encyclical of his. Yeah, and he, he has great answers to these problems. Right. Can't wait to get to them. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last problem that we want to identify is what he calls the capitalistic economic dictatorship. This is in paragraphs 105 through 107. Do you want to yeah. just give us a yeah, little? Yeah, sure. So well, I'll read a bit of 105 and perhaps 107. In the first place, it is obvious that not only is wealth concentrated in our times, but an immense power and despotic economic dictatorship is consolidated in the hands of a few, who often are not owners, but only the trustees and managing directors of invested funds, which they administer according to their own arbitrary will and pleasure. And then fast forwarding to 107, this concentration of power and might, the characteristic mark, as it were, of contemporary economic life is the fruit that the unlimited freedom of struggle among competitors has of its own nature produced and which lets only the strongest survive. And this is often the same as saying those who fight the most violently, those who give least heed to their conscience. So uh, a couple of things I think are highlighted there by Pope Pius. The, the thing we talked about, about this violent competitiveness vicious and you know he says toward the end that it's the people that listen at least to their conscience that are going to build up the most wealth and power and that's become the norm you know that that's the culture that has been built essentially i think is what he's saying and he also i think brings up this idea that now wealth is not only just wealth and subsistence for myself it's really become this kind of power you know Mm -hmm. this this he uses the word dictatorship um and Mm -hmm. I think that really, I think he's starting to say that this has become a bigger problem than before. Before it was just, you know, people were suffering and a lot of people had money. But now this really means that these people are controlling things. Mm -hmm. He specifically calls out trustees and managing directors, which is kind of a new, Pope Leo didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Pope Pius does. So he brings, there's a lot of things there. And I think that these few paragraphs are great. Yeah. So let's get into the solutions. So we've laid out the problems, right? Mm -hmm. And Pope Pius does a great job of laying out solutions to solve those problems. Like the first 11 paragraphs of Quadragesimo Anna are just Pope Pius praising, like like I said earlier, drooling over Rerum Navarum. He's making, he makes it seem, like he, say, he says that there are people in the Vatican celebrating, and it makes it seem like they're running around with cardboard cutouts of Leo and <laughs> waving the encyclical in the air, and, and everyone's just like partying, and there's beer everywhere. And, you know, that's what it sounds like. It really sounds like it's this parade for Rerum Navarum. There's that, and then he, he calls it immortal, mm-hmm. and he speaks about it in a really lofty way, which I think is good. Like I think he's doing that on purpose, and I think he's trying to say, like we said in our last episode, that po- that Rerum Novarum is kind of this central foundation for Catholic social teaching mm-hmm. and doctrine, essentially. Yeah, Rerum Novarum it could have been written and then ignored from from that point on. Right. And the fact that this comes out celebrating its 40th anniversary and praising it to the degree that it does, it does two things. It solidifies that this is going to be a thing, a a true Catholic social science, Mm. right? Number one. Number two, it gives people who didn't read Ram Navarum an opportunity to read it in Quadragesimo (laughs) because there is a lot of time spent on just summarizing Ram Navarum. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the footnotes, it's like a lot yeah. is just rare in the varum. Yeah. So that's before he gets into the solution. But mm-hmm. then, uh, like we said, th- we focused on kind of the philosophy of the solution in last episode, the philosophy behind Pope Leo's solution. And I think the same is done by Pope Pius. He kind of promulgates his philosophy in mm-hmm, a way. Mm-hmm. And I said earlier that that we, we were, the, one of the problems was this polarization between individualism and collectivism. So Pope Pius's response and his philosophy is this big picture focus on individual human dignity so that's the individual side Mm -hmm. with then a real responsibility and almost like a duty to the common good to caring for the common good and what what that is is individuals giving up their own comforts oftentimes for the sake of others right yeah right absolutely and this this isn't new I mm-hmm. think Popeyes is just now, again, affirming. I know it reminds me of an easy way to think about this balance between the individual and the responsibility to the common good is what we talked about last episode about living becomingly. And then what is what is over that, uh, what's left over is what we kind of owe mm-hmm. to our neighbor. And I think that that's the balance that, once again, Popeyes is really trying to highlight that yeah. people are not living by... And that line with becomingly is is vague, and I think some would stress or would would struggle with that line more than others. One of the ladies who used to live here on the property, we we work in a mansion here. She owns six maroon Rolls Royces. Yeah, that's a little more than bec- <laughs> that's a little more than becomingly. I, I mean, they were all the same color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why did you need? Why did you need so many? So intense. <laughs> that that is above be- becomingly. We right. can say that for sure. Right. Okay, so in addition to, to, to those things, we, we have another philosophical solution, which is the appeal to the Catholic economic principles that starts out in Ram Navarum, and then the, we add another one or two today with Quadragesimo Anno. So sticking to those principles is the solution, he's good, he says, and he, uh, we're quoting him directly, he says that more than once, mm-hmm. uh, stick to those principles. And then lastly... He says, justice alone should not be the aim. Mm -hmm. I think this is really important. So in the the leftist movement of the United States right now, we hear all about social justice, social justice. Well, who started social justice? (laughs) Who coined the term? Who started it? Mm -hmm. It was Catholics in the 1840s, Mm. which becomes popularized in the 1890s with Rerum Navarum. And that kind of justice is the classical understanding of justice. Mm. While the left in the United States today, I would have to say, have no idea of what justice is, even though they're, they're touting that word. Right. They're, they're repeating that word and that term all the time. So they've stolen it <laughs> and they have misappropriated it, right? Mm. But that's not even the end in Catholicism. So yeah, we, inv- we invented social justice, but more importantly, that's not our end. What's the end, according to Pope Pius? Charity. So he says, you know, justice is good, and that's a good goal for, like, a brainless government, right, that operates as a community of people. It's not a person. But the individual isn't thinking justice. The individual is thinking charity. Right. A thinking being. Yeah. The perfection is not justice, but charity. Right. Which goes far beyond Mm -hmm. what's necessary. Yeah, and I also, I think I'd like to highlight that word charity, especially maybe for young people, and maybe I'm saying this just because I've thought about it this way, and my understanding, I think, of charity has grown. Mm -hmm. Because I think the same way that justice, the word justice has kind of been stolen and redefined and Mm -hmm. whatnot, I think charity maybe wasn't stolen, but it's also been redefined to some degree for young people. At least I had a different understanding. Mm -hmm. So my understanding of charity maybe before becoming Catholic and as, as I was really embracing the faith was just giving money to poor people or giving money to charitable organizations Mm -hmm. or like, you know, we have a Catholic charities office in most dioceses. Mm -hmm. And I think, while, while giving alms is certainly part of charity, absolutely, it's not the end. And I think charity has this real philosophical, real thoughtful meaning. It's funny you say this. So, like, giving, if somebody doesn't have a house and you give them a house, that's justice. That's not charity. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so that's, I guess what I, what I mean to say is that, for me, charity for a long time just meant 
justice. Like, mm-hmm. let me give them what they're supposed yeah. to have. Yeah. That's charity. That's how I thought. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, you start unpacking the, the Catholic tradition and, you know, oh, charity is one of our theological virtues. That's a big thing. Mm-hmm. So it can't just be, let me give a sandwich to a homeless person. Yeah, of course, that's charitable. Um, but charity is more. Charity, like we, we've talked about it before, you know, the Greek word, agape. Well, yeah, the, the Greek word, we've been using the word kenosis, which mm-hmm. has to do with like self-sacrificial emptying mm-hmm. kind of love. But St. Paul, like when he's talking about the, the faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, he uses the word agape. Right. Yeah, right. which in Latin becomes caritas. Right. And in English becomes charity, mm-hmm. old English. <laughs> no one uses charity anymore, that word. Even if they're giving, they want to use the word philanthropy because that's cooler. <laughs> So, so now we use the word love, mm-hmm. but you could love pizza. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love pizza. I love other people. Right. right? It's, it's a watered down, almost meaningless word. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, and I guess what I mean to say is that it's what proper charity and the charity that Pope Pius is talking about is that initial, like what, what, what kenosis, what Paul a, talks kenosis about. Kenosis agape. Yeah. Right. It's like yeah. this real intense, like the love that God has for us. Mm-hmm. That's charity. Properly understood. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think he puts that beautifully also. And that was just a note, because I think that would have helped me if I was listening to this as a young Catholic to our podcast. Mm -hmm. So when he says that charity is greater than justice, you know, he's echoing even Paul, that charity is the greatest of the theological virtues. So when he says that justice alone cannot be the aim, Pope Pius says this, but in affecting all this, the law of charity, which is the bond of perfection, must always take a leading role, for justice alone can remove the causes of social conflict, but can never bring about the union of minds and hearts. Mm-hmm. So I think in short, like you said, if you give someone that doesn't have a house a house, that's justice. That's getting rid of the social conflict. Like, you know, we're fixing a problem, mm-hmm. kind of like the proper order. But that alone isn't enough for pious and for Catholics. It should be what he says The union of minds and hearts. And we've talked about hearts and stuff a lot. But when I first read that, I couldn't help but think about, like, you know, what we said in our podcast, that it's not these systems, it's Mm -hmm. the hearts. And my reading of this was, you know, oh, what everyone wants to do is build the right system. They only want justice. They want the system to fix the problems, to build this nice order. But we said that's not enough. It never has been enough, and it never will be enough. That's not the answer. It's the hearts. Mm -hmm. And for pious... That's this virtue of charity. So Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the central biblical passage of this podcast and, and the primary uh, economic principle of episode three of the Paul Street Journal in the first season, it was kenosis, right? And we chose that word because of what St. Paul says in Philippians chapter two. That's the core passage for this podcast because he, in, in paragraph 70, Pope uh, Pius XI says, union in minds of hearts. That's what we need to bring about. So what does St. Paul say in, first, in, in uh, Philippians 2? He says, be uh, of one mind, united in heart, thinking one thing. Mm. And then he uses the word kenosis, talking about how Jesus empties himself and how it's our job to f- imitate that. Yeah. Right? Wow. So all of, th- all of these words are coming together from that one passage in this encyclical. Yeah, right? that's beautiful. You think P- Pius must have been thinking about that. He seemed like a smart guy. Oh, he knew, yeah. <laughs> he probably was reading the original Greek manuscripts of Philippians too. <laughs> what yeah. a nerd. Yeah. Thank God for the nerds. And then he hiked on a mountain. Okay, <laughs> so we've identified the solutions from a philosophical perspective, and now we're going to get into the more fine-tuned responses, solutions to the problem. Mm. And we... Freddie and I have categorized these solutions into two categories. The first being adjustments and developments from Rerum Navarum. And then the second category being some p- kind of brand new stuff. Right. That's, that's specific to Pope Pius XI. Yeah. So let's do the adjustments first. Sure. What does he develop from Rerum Navarum? Well, I think this is very important for everybody. If you weren't paying attention, just <laughs> start now. Uh, Pope Pius XI, without any vagueness, says that there is no version of socialism that is acceptable. Okay, so we we talked about how there were the bad communist socialists, but 
there could be maybe some really nice, more Christian-inspired types of socialists, yeah. a milder, less violent version of socialism. Mm -hmm. And what does Pope Pius XI say? No. Right. You know, we could read the quote if you want. Yeah. I but no is, is what he says. <laughs> right. I think he, he basically, he also says that Catholics are asking him mm -hmm. yeah. if that's acceptable. Yeah. Like, you know, as the Holy Father, hey, is this version acceptable? It's kind of moderate. It's not. It seems more mm -hmm. principled with our Christian principles, mm -hmm. but like he said, he says no. And he says, you know, I feel this duty to answer my flock about yeah. this question. So he says, in keeping with our fatherly solicitude to answer these petitions, we make this pronouncement. Whether considered as a doctrine or an historical fact or a movement, socialism, if it remains truly socialism, even after it has yielded to truth and justice on the points which we have mentioned, cannot be reconciled with the teachings of the Catholic Church because its concept of society itself is utterly foreign to Christian truth. So that's his answer. And then a couple paragraphs later he says, If socialism, like all errors, contains some truth, it is based nevertheless on a theory of human society peculiar to itself and irreconcilable with true Christianity. Religious socialism, Christian socialism are contradictory terms. No one can be at the same time a good Catholic and a true socialist. All right, so that ends that discussion. I think we spent more time in this podcast explaining why that's true than Pope Pius XI spends in Quadragesimo Anno. So mm. to understand why that that's the case, why he makes that pronouncement, it probably makes sense to go back to season one mm -hmm. on, the, on that episode that talks about socialism because we, we weigh Catholic understanding, Catholic philosophy, history, right. all that stuff, theology, against the, the very foundational components, mm -hmm. the, uh, the philosophical underpinnings that socialism, you know, just takes for granted. Yeah. And they just do not, they are not compatible. Absolutely. Um, and Pope Pius is the Pope. So mm -hmm. what he says, he can say it and it's like, oh, wait, yeah. he's right. If yeah. we said it, people would be like, all right, whatever, losers. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we had to do some unpacking. <laughs> right, right. All right. So the next adjustment that he makes, it's actually an expansion of what Pope Leo the 13th had to say about the rule of pay or like how, how does an employer and employee come to an agreement mm. ideally mm -hmm. on on what pay looks like how, how is leo's rule of pay or working for pay how is that expanded by pope pius first of all he says that pay cannot be determined by a single rule which i will call the sin of single ruleism Nice. And I just made that up. So <laughs> it's an ism. It has to be. It, it's just these driving forces of the market that decides, right? And an employer will pay the least amount that somebody will take. That's the single rule. Mm -hmm. So what Pius XI is saying is that, no, it's not just one single rule. It's all of the Catholic principles that determine what is just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's important that he doesn't lay them out himself either. He's he, he's like, there's room for discernment. Mm -hmm. But one thing that is true is that it's not just one rule. And I think that, like the other things we've walked through, there are these principles and then this responsibility to discern. Mm -hmm. And I think the same yeah. is true about this rule for pay. And I mm -hmm. think that's what he's reaffirming. Yeah, and he gives, he gives us some things to consider. So he believes that the pay of a working man, and I don't mean that, in general humanity, he's talking about a man, a, a male. Mm -hmm. The worker of a man should support his whole family. That includes his wife and his children. Mm -hmm. And he believes that women who are forced to work because the father's wage is too low is an, an intolerable abuse. Mm. Boy, okay, so we're filming this in the year 2024. <laughs> uh, as outdated as it sounds, I think he's on to something. He does not believe, and this goes back to the nuclear family mm -hmm. issue we were talking about last week. Right. But as a person, personally, who works full-time, my wife works full-time. We're trying to raise three kids, mm -hmm. keep a household going. Keeping a house is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. We're trying to eat healthy, cook our own meals. We're trying to stay physically fit. We're trying to be good friends. We're trying to be good family members. We're trying to 
be generous to the poor, right? There's so much to do. Mm -hmm. The belief here that's being proposed is that each household has one full-time worker mm -hmm. and the other is home to be able to take care of the children. The argument could be made that the person who is staying home and, and raising the children and teaching them to be good, good human beings is the most valuable thing that a person can do. Right. And the most important thing for society. Mm -hmm. So this could come across to many as ogenist, sexist, mm -hmm. out of date. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we should be a little bit honest with ourselves and, and think to ourselves, wow, that, I mean, that would be quite a change. Yeah. If, if this were to be fulfilled. Yeah, I think a lot of perhaps Catholic circles have tried to embrace this and, and see the, tr the truth that's in mm -hmm. what Pius is trying to say. And I also don't think he's saying women can never work. You know, it's not necessarily that. But it's clearly stated in the family context. Right, right yeah. exactly. Yeah. So we want to make sure that it's not read like that. But I completely see I, I completely see the desire here to have this ordered family where there's, you know, a wage earner and mm -hmm. then the person that's taking care of the children is ideally a parent or a family member, extended family. Mm -hmm. So it, it really it sounds at least like we, we haven't unpacked this idea yet. Maybe we'll do an episode in the future specifically about single income family or single income households or whatnot. Mm. Yeah, he's very strong in his language here. Mm -hmm. He's making himself very clear. A two worker family household is intolerable, he says. Right. But, if the uh, father's wages are too low. Right, right. Unless they both choose to work, which like... Yeah, I think today a, a lot of people work that don't need to. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why is because people's perception and the standard of living is so high. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a big part of why there's a lot of two-parent working households these mm -hmm. days. He also talks about pay adjustments to adjust for the, the cost of living, which happens a lot today. Mm. which is really nice. So as inflation decreases the value of the dollar, pay raise ideally matches that. Right. Yeah. He also talks about bad workers. He says those who don't work but can work should not eat, but workers that do work should have a, w a living wage. Mm -hmm. And then he says there's some bad workers out there. So here he is talking from capital's perspective. <laughs> the, the church is always defending the poor, right? The widow. But you know what capital says to that? What the, the employers say is, oh, I have all these workers who just don't try. They show up late. They don't stay on top of the, the innovations and become worthless to, to my company. So here we are, the son of a silk factory owner. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of speaking on behalf of employers here. And he says, bad workers that are lazy, not evolving with the advancements of, of the sector, they should be cared for as much of, as possible, but if this puts the whole organization at risk, employers should be kind and generous, but necessary moves might have to be made. And if that's the case, the church could be involved. If not, the government could be involved to make sure that this is done in the most generous way possible. Right. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like this is a, a development of kind of like a, a right to work almost. Like when he said, when you said the workers that can work should work or should be given the opportunity to work, I think is how he says it. I think that's, it's an adjustment or an advancement. Yep. Mm. And then, and then his, his ability to represent employers is an adjustment as right. well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that, that's some of Pope Pius's advice for developing a rule of pay. And I think it probably gets developed after this, like you said. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to his other adjustments and developments. The next that we have being that the law protects property, as we've mentioned from Pope Leo's developments, but does not impose charity slash morality, which it kind of just checks, mm -hmm. it checks in with everything that we've been developing uh, as far as justice and charity go. So I think he, he basically says that it's not the government's responsibility to impose this law of charity kenosis. It's mm -hmm. ours. It's the hearts and the minds, not the system that we develop. Yeah, it's, it's just pretty a, straightforward. It, it is straightforward. He, he's just making a clear line for what government's role is. Right. Yeah, the government protects private property. Right. Right. It's the conscience of Christian individuals that is the driver of charity. Right. Yeah. 
And then next, he says that associations should and maybe must take some of the burden off of the overwhelmed government that we've talked about already. And we, we highlighted this before, that mm-hmm. the state and individuals leaves the state burdened. Mm-hmm. And the societal structure that Pius would desire is this one of associations, like Leo has pointed out, that take some of these responsibilities away, which we'll highlight a bit more in the additions that he makes to, to Leo's work. Yeah, you know, the opposite is happening right now. So uh, state Supreme Court just ruled against the National Association of Realtors, who was coming up with standards and regulations for best practices and so forth even standardizing commission rates, right? And with the incredible ho- increase in the price of housing and the housing so- shortages, who, what's being attacked first? The association, <laughs> instead of all of the other bigger problems that are causing yeah. high, high prices, yeah. uh, which is, you know, tough. Yeah. Tougher for realtors, maybe. But mm-hmm. uh, all right, next. Next, he talks about partnership contracts or Mm. In other words, like an employer and an employee, different from an employer and employee, a partnership contract is highly encouraged but not required because Pius says that there's this idea Mm -hmm. being brought about that employer and employee contracts are inherently unjust, that they need to be replaced with partnership contracts. This is perhaps influenced by like the socialist ideas, Mm. perhaps that we should own our work together exclusively. But he says that that idea is wrong. And he says that partnership contracts are great and can help and we should use them to influence work contracts. But they're not necessarily required as some might want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So following Leo's encyclical in 1891, there was a type of, a group of Catholics who said, we are no longer doing employer-employee contracts at all. All contracts have to be partnership. And then they started saying that that needs to be the case for all Catholics. It needs to be imposed on everybody. And what, what Pius XI is simply saying is these partnership contracts are better and they're encouraged, but they're not required. Right. So whenever, whenever a group of people can come together and create a corporation where they're all owners, mm-hmm. as opposed to like one person being the owner and the rest being workers, like that partnership model is better. Because everybody's an owner, everybody gets their one vote, right? Everybody gets a share of the profits. That's better, mm-hmm. right? And talk about incentive, being a part owner and taking part in the the growth right. of that. That's a that's a beautiful thing. But that's not that's more of an ideal than a necessity, is yeah. what what he's saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just imagine if if all of us listening and and producing this podcast, you know weren't able to be employed <laughs> yeah no, that <laughs> you worked. know to take part in a contract like that that would be that would be maybe burdensome right? yeah yeah okay that that makes up the whole of our adjustments mm-hmm. and expansions category now we're going to move on to the category that we're calling additions this is newer content that is being introduced almost specifically by Pope Pius, Pius the 11th mm-hmm. all right what's the first one so the first one which I briefly mentioned before is this right to work which is slightly touched upon in his rule of pay, but one that can work should be able to work. He should have the opportunity. I'll use Pius's words, but another point scarcely less important and especially vital in our times must not be overlooked, namely that the opportunity to work be provided to those who are able and willing to work. So this is a right almost, which I think is important. And I think it's something we would perhaps believe today that, you know, people have this right to work if they're able and willing. And we've said that it's almost exclusively developed by, not exclusively, but really developed as a new thing by Pope Pius. Yeah, it's, it's, it's made explicit in, in Quadragesimo Anno. Mm-hmm. So there it is. I, I don't know what else to say about it except that he says so. Right. So I don't know. He doesn't provide advice on how to make that happen, mm-hmm. right? He just says it. So, right. So I feel like it's it's another principle, s- perhaps something that needs time. to be developed. Really, yeah, it's kind of like calling for development. Yeah, another thing he he mentions is the right to leave an inheritance. Now, this might sound obvious or not to, to our listening audience, but it was a it was a very intense thing to say at that time. Both both of these things because they're they're representing opposite spectrums of the political scene. Right. Right. So the right to work, that would be something a leftist might say in 1931. The right to leave an inheritance was something is something somebody on the right would say. Absolutely. And he's saying both. So 
the New Deal, it, it employs, it, it begins to mobilize and employ the unemployed, mm. which Leo would like. But the New Deal also starts to heavily tax inheritances, which Leo, or which Pius, I should say, yeah. would not like, right? right. So wh what we're seeing here is this, this balance of things. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're not working, you're not going to leave much of an inheritance. So <laughs> one does lead to the other, and they should be combined. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think that's also probably a specific response to, like you've mentioned, the left. Mm -hmm. Wanting not some, you know, sh uh, a strict communist state would you know, leave no inheritance. Mm -hmm. It's all owned collectively, mm -hmm. not your children. You, you don't pass this on to your children, but to the whole society. So I think it, it's a very immediate response to that. Yeah. The inheritance taxes are, are in, in this era and in other areas, they could be like really oppressive. Mm -hmm. And it's an attack on private property. Right. Yeah. Right. So the next thing, which is an important, very important addition from Popeyes, is this principle or th idea of subsidiarity, which is a response to the problem, perhaps, that was pointed out by, between the state and individuals being the only two bodies that make up a society. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll read his quote because I think it's well put. Uh, it's kind of long, so I'll try to just parse out the, the important bits. For subsidiarity, he says, as history abundantly proves, it is true that on account of changed conditions, many things which were done by small associations in former times cannot be done now, save by large associations. Still, that most weighty principle, which cannot be set aside or changed, remains fixed and unshaken in social philosophy. So this is his principle. Just as it is gravely wrong to take from individuals what they can accomplish by their own initiative and industry and give it to the community, so also it is an injustice and at the same time a grave evil and disturbance of right order to assign to a greater and higher association what lesser and subordinate organizations can do. For every social activity ought of its very nature to furnish help to the members of the body social and never destroy and absorb them. So I think that's paragraph 79. And he does this, he makes a, a claim against the right and also a claim against the left. It's unjust essentially for the government or bigger organizations or associations to have responsibilities at smaller ones. So I'll read the, the, the next part which is paragraph 80 says therefore those in power should be sure that the more perfectly a graduated order is kept among the various associations in observance of the principle of subsidiary function the stronger social authority and effectiveness will be the happier and more prosperous the condition of the state so there's that word subsidiary function mm -hmm. so you want to unpack Maybe a little pious is just briefly to... so i want to start by saying that this was a principle that we observed in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And before the industrial era, subsidiarity was assumed as necessary. We talked about the tithe of, of the Israelites being 10% of their produce, being just a ton of food. There's no way you could just transport that 70 miles to the central government in Jerusalem. Right. Right. You brought your 10%, that giant amount of food to the closest Levite city, then they brought 10% of what they had to Jerusalem. And that idea of resources starting at the bottom and flowing up was very good because it, as Pius would say, it relieved the government of many responsibilities. Mm -hmm. It induced ownership because wealth and property was distributed broadly, more broadly. And finally, local government is the most efficient and effective type of government. Nobody knows what needs to be done in a local area better than the locals who live there. Right. So that is subsidiary function mm -hmm. as he states it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's for me it's a beautiful image to picture like the chain of subsidiarity like it's starting in the smallest sphere uh, in the home mm -hmm. and like you said local is best they're, they're going to know a, a father and a mother will know what's best for their children mm -hmm. probably and then above that perhaps a local mayor will know what's best for his town maybe it sounds like common sense to some but i think he tries to develop it as this really intentional principle in which you know he's responding to this problem where the state has way too much responsibility way too many things to do Americans struggle with this principle maybe more than any other principle. <laughs> and the history of the United States just shows how, how dysfunctional it's been with this principle. Mm. For example, 
those on the right will see them the, themselves as acting out subsidiarity well with the idea of federalism. That is taking power away from the national government and giving it to the 50 states. The left in the United States will argue that that was why slavery existed, right? You give power to states, they're going to abuse that power to oppress individuals and take individual dignity away from them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, and, and even after the Emancipation Proclamation, new laws came about to oppress African Americans in the South under the guise of states' rights. So this is, this is a subsidiarity like just gone awry, detached from other principles, right? right? In Catholicism, we see we're combining principles and we're saying every individual has uh, infinite dignity. Slavery is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the role of every level of government, including the federal government, right. to make that determination. Mm -hmm. But we also believe in subsidiarity function, mm -hmm. this idea of local government being best best government, but not to the point where it's inflicting harm on individuals. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, and I think we've tried to emphasize that throughout the entire podcast that mm -hmm. these principles go together. You mm -hmm. can't pick and choose. Mm -hmm. So next we we have what well, he does not name this. Pius doesn't call this the universal destination of goods. But that is one of the Catholic social teaching, like, yeah. Titles. So one of the, one of the, one of the big, well-known principles of Catholic social teaching, which you will find in the compendium on the social doctrine of the Church, which we'll get to mm -hmm. in, in future episodes. But for now, what we see, what I've discovered reading it again, preparing for this episode, is that it is described by Leo and Quadragesimo Anno. It's just not named yet. Mm. So let's read his explanation of it and uh, if you're catholic you have to you have to remember this this is important so this is paragraph 45 so Pius says first then let it be considered as certain and established that neither leo nor those theologians who have taught under the guidance and authority of the church have ever denied or questioned the twofold character of ownership called usually individual or social according as it regards either separate persons or the common good for they have always unanimously maintained that nature, rather, the creator himself, has given man the right of private ownership, not only that individuals may be able to provide for themselves and their families, but also that the goods which the creator destined for the entire family of mankind may through this institution truly serve this purpose. All this can be achieved in no wise except through the maintenance of a certain and definite order. And I, I think this is central to his it's an entire encyclical. This mm -hmm. is the, the, the idea of individuals having infinite dignity and all these rights, but then also this responsibility to the common mm -hmm. good. He calls it the fam the entire family of mankind. Beautifully put. Yeah, so, so as a result of this paragraph, we get the concept that is eventually called the universal destination of goods, which means that as Catholics, we're not seeing somebody in, in a faraway nation as so different than ourselves and as competitors or enemies or just too far away even like we like them they're just so far away right <laughs> no we have concern for them yeah so no matter where a person is no matter what their religion the mark of of god is is stamped mm -hmm. on their soul in their being and they matter and we care absolutely and goods so if if we if we have excess and they have nothing, you know, it we are responsible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This I think flows perfectly from the principle set from Leo of you know stewardship mm -hmm. and caring for this. Stewardship means everything we have is given to us by God. Mm -hmm. I am simply a steward of His goodness and grace and His gifts. So that means that I have to share those with my my family. That being the whole world, everyone marked by God's. Yeah, stamp. Yeah, you know what tugs on my conscience the most in with this principle? What's that? Is waste. Whenever I have so much excess that I'm wasting and and then I I'll see someone else somewhere else just suffering from a uh, want. Mm. That that's good guilt. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, the type of guilt that induces action. Absolutely. And that that prompts change yeah I, that's part of that maybe guilt or that thought is what maybe helps discern 
better discern what it means to live becomingly. If I'm living mm. in a way where I, there's a lot of waste, mm -hmm. maybe it's time that I start giving some more, you know? Mm. And I think, that, again, you mentioned earlier, some people might get a little nervous about how what living becomingly means, mm. a little obsessive maybe. But again, you, it's just this constant discernment day by day. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe I'm wasting too much. Let me make mm -hmm. an adjustment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great point. Next, which is also a, a, another addition and also really awesome and great because it's something we feel very connected to. I, yeah, I, this might be my favorite one. <laughs> so yeah. it's this idea of lay apostles. So we'll read some of his words and then unpack them a little because this is amazing. It's great. And we'll, we'll, we'll share why we think so. It is chiefly your duty, venerable brethren, and of your clergy to search diligently for these lay apostles, both of workers and of employers, to select them with prudence and to train and instruct them properly. Especially it is necessary that those whom you intend to assign in particular to this work should demonstrate that they are men possessed of the keenest sense of justice, who will resist with true manly courage the dishonest demands or the unjust acts of anyone who will excel in the prudence and judgment which avoids every extreme, and above all, who will be deeply permeated by the charity of Christ, which alone has the power to subdue firmly but gently the hearts and wills of men to the laws of justice and equity. We earnestly exhort in the Lord to give themselves wholly to the training of men committed to their care, and in the discharge of the eminently priestly and apostolic duty to make proper use of the resources of Christian education by teaching youth, forming Christian organizations, and founding study groups guided by principles and harmony with faith. So this is bits and pieces of, of a longer um, explanation of this lay apostleship. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this clear call for his venerable brethren being the bishops and then the, the priests under them to find lay people, workers, employers, that they can essentially train as missionaries to their own people. Like mm -hmm. if it's a, it's a miner, a coal miner, it's going to be a little harder for the bishop to go into a coal mine and say, hey guys, this is what we need to do. So what P Pope Pius is calling for is finding perhaps telling their pastors, find in your local parish these people that you can train, that you are that you trust. Mm -hmm. And after you've trained them, send them out into the world, back into their professions to build this Christian character everywhere. This is a, a more effective way of doing it, perhaps, is what he's recommending. And please, chime well, in. Well, I mean, this is obviously the, the biblical model. So... The reason why we have one billion Catholics today is not from any other means other than apostleship and discipleship, right? So Jesus trains 12 guys for three years on how to live the life, how to teach the teachings, and then he sends them out, and those apostles make apostles, and those apostles make apostles, and now we have one billion people. So very effective marketing strategy <laughs> from Jesus. And, and, and that's what he's saying to do here. And that, that's the, the purpose of St. Paul Inside the Wall. So we exist to do just that. Right. The, the gate to heaven is shoulder width. It's like this wide. I think most people think of the Simpsons heaven gate, which is very Gentleness. wide. But, but it's actually shoulder width apart. And one person enters heaven at a time. And that's how apostleship works. It's mm -hmm. you and I sitting across the table and talking about this. And then you and I go sit at separate tables with two other people. Mm -hmm. And then those two. So there, there's exponential growth. It's compounding. And, and that's the most effective. Uh, it's relationship-based. So at St. Paul's, we're doing that for evangelization in general, not just for Catholic social teaching and economics. Right. But even this podcast, I think if, if somebody listens to this whole podcast, all 100 episodes, two hours each, they, it would have been hopefully just as good as sitting across the right. table. Yeah, that's uh, so. So the very purpose of St. Paul Inside the Walls in this podcast is to fulfill this very call by Pope Pius. Absolutely, yeah. and I love it. I think one thing that I'm not sure if we'll get to that document in this podcast because it's perhaps less connected, but one thing that this paragraph made me think about is Vatican II's document, mm. Lumen Gentium, Gentium, yeah. Gentium yep. about, and specifically the section on this universal call to holiness, where it's this, again, it's not necessarily something new, but it's this affirmation that it's not just 
bishops, priests, nuns, hermits, monks that are holy. It's everyone. This is universal call to holiness, which includes the laity, which includes the priests, which includes mm-hmm. the clergy, the religious, everything. So um, wait, Jesus in the Gospels, he doesn't say, hey, just ordain ministers, be holy, just as your <laughs> heavenly father is holy. He doesn't no, say that? he does not say that. Oh, okay. Unless, I mean, I, maybe. <laughs> no, he doesn't say that. Yeah. And I think what I appreciate here is that Pope Pius, in a way, says that. Uh, he mm-hmm. says, you know, train these workers. Mm-hmm to be apostles in a sense. Yeah, yeah. And, that, you know, it, that's, it, that's, now that you've mentioned it, I, that's a little scandalous to call a lay person a, an apostle, right? right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like uh, the new era of Priscilla and Aquila. I'm not familiar. Don't worry. <laughs> St. Paul it makes these, these two, it's a couple, husband and wife, makes them a new apostles in Corinth. And, oh, I see. And they eventually nice. find their way to Rome. Yeah. So I think what's, because I, I guess the, the idea here is that like if you just sent priests you know the, the the way to become holy isn't just or the way to evangelize isn't necessarily only through the sacraments mm, it's mm-hmm. like yeah the ordained ministers can do that but that's not it we need more and i think that's what's baked into the universal call to holiness which is why you need to send out a mm-hmm. lay minister and a lay missionary to to really really live out and share and welcome everyone into that christian life mm-hmm. and I think also one of my favorite additions, maybe, because it, maybe it reminds me of St. Paul's and of mm-hmm. what we're trying to do here. We're trying to be lay apostles, in a mm-hmm. sense, mm-hmm. and train lay apostles. Mm-hmm. We're entering into stoppage time now. Right. <laughs> and I just have one more question before we finish this. And we're, we're discussing this 140-year-old, 130-year-old Catholic social science. And I wonder if it has had an effect on your spirituality? Because this is somewhat new to you. You're somewhat new to the world. You're like 20-something, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so, so. You know, how does it affect your spiritual life? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I, so I, I thank uh, Popeye. I said thank the nerds for you know, all this. And, I, you know, maybe I'm somewhat of a nerd. I'm not the athlete in that he was talking about earlier. But what I've noticed, I think, for me personally, is that really diving into and learning about the Catholic social science and Catholic economics, as it were, and what our podcast is about, I think it really, for me, sheds light on Christian spirituality in general, like what it means to be Christian altogether. And it's like this this sphere or this area that's really shed so much light, I think, on all of the Christian life for me. And I, I guess specifically for the spiritual question, I think it's helped me realize maybe perhaps especially with the principle of stewardship, that everything that is mine, I've been given by God. Everything, the physical things, and then realizing that about the physical things in this principle of stewardship, it really sheds light on the spiritual realities, that everything, that means my body, my soul, and everything within it, um, is given to me. And in a sense, stewardship means that I need to use it properly. Uh, so it's absolutely, I think, informed my my way of understanding myself as a person, body, soul. And this, it, and, and I guess I say that specifically because I think that this, as we've mentioned, is perhaps a very unknown or underappreciated or understudied or underrated kind of topic in Catholic social teaching or in Catholic teaching in general. You know, mm-hmm. we've mentioned with Father Paul that some people pay less attention to these doctrines Mm-hmm. So once I've once I did delve into it a bit deeper, it's really I think shown me so much more beauty in the Catholic tradition and what it means to be Christian. And I mean, I hope it's really doing the same because I mean this. I, I think it's really helped my spiritual life as a as a individual Christian. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, no, I'll I'll say the same. Yeah, um, awesome. So you I, had more time to do it. You're way older than me. You know, I'm, you're not that new to the world. Yeah, there's many spiritual and uh, temporal fruits mm. that have come about. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that does it for Quadragesimo Anno, 40th year anniversary of Rerum Novarum. So there are more that come after Rerum Novarum, named after or, or published on the anniversary of Rerum Novarum. So there's still more development to come, still more additions. But I think that this... Like Brian said, if you didn't read Rare on the Farm, just read this. He basically writes, summarizes <laughs> it all together. And I'm looking forward to the next few episodes. I think they're going to go in a really good direction. 
And I hope that you enjoyed this. And I hope that it's having the same effect on you that it's had on us. So I just want to say thank you, Brian. Thanks, Joe. And thank you all for listening to the Paul Street Journal. See you next time. Thank you.